Okay, so anytime we come to the Word, anytime we come to Revelation, we need to ask our Father's help. Anybody willing to lead us as we ask Him for His help? Thank you, Nancy. Dear Father, we come before you tonight and ask for your guidance and your wisdom and to just help us understand and Ryan to teach. Uh, we ask for uh, prayers for our nation too, Lord, as there's a lot of unrest going on right now. We know no matter who gets in that uh, you are still king and in charge. We ask for patience and understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Agreed. Agreed. All right. Well, as we start, will somebody read for us Revelation 21, verses 1 to 8? I will. All right. Thank you, Sue. <clears throat> then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of the burning sulfur. This is the second death. All right. Again, it... This section ends on quite the uh, rude awakening to the reality of things. But uh, we're in the, the good section here in verse 2. <clears throat> and so we've already seen in verse 2, uh, we've looked at the idea of the holy Jerusalem that is the, or the holy city that is the new Jerusalem that is in heaven. We talked about that last time. This is not a new idea here in verse 2. Um, the Jew, as Hector pointed out, the Jewish people seem to have an idea of that already because the temple slash tabernacle was already a copy of heavenly things. Mm -hmm. So you kind of extrapolate from there, maybe the city of Jerusalem. And certainly you would, in the ancient world, you would of course assume that a king rules in a capital city type environment. So why wouldn't the king of heaven have a capital city environment in his heaven? So uh, what I wanted to do today though is carry on with looking at the New Jerusalem, but specifically what it says there about the dwelling place in verse 3. Um, it's, it's easy for us to kind of walk past the Jerusalem concept because, number one, we're Americans living on the side of the planet. Number two, we're Gentiles, and we've never lived under a temple system, ever, right? And we do have our own versions of that because we do see a sacredness to church buildings and things like that. But even that's not really biblical. It's strictly biblically speaking, who is the, the temple of God, of Christ right now on earth? His body, the church, right? So even though we do, we kind of go amiss a little bit with viewing certain buildings as especially holy or God lives there kind of stuff. Um, I think verbally we'd usually say that isn't where God lives, that isn't where God lives. He lives in us. So again, it's easy for us to kind of dismiss the whole idea of the, the Jerusalem and the temple as just kind of a piece of the old thing we don't, we don't have to deal with anymore. I would remind you though, if we're seeing it in this vision, and as we saw last time in Isaiah 65, a part of the new creation promise is the Jerusalem Jerusalem being made delightful to God. Do you remember that in Isaiah 65? That was actually a centerpiece of his whole vision of the new, new creation was Jerusalem itself being made delightful 
His people are going to be a joy there. So if God himself is making Jerusalem a centerpiece, and then we see it here in Revelation 21, it's a centerpiece of the new creation, I just think we ought to dwell on it and enjoy it, because God obviously will. So I just wanted to kind of walk through the old covenant picture of this, uh, more, th- more so than I could do last time. A lot of this is actually review, but it's been so long. That's okay. <laughs> it's a good review. So in Exodus 25, verse 8, uh, this is shortly after the people of Israel have left Egypt. Moses gets a word from Yahweh about his intent and his desire to actually live among these people. There is so much drama to this, but we're just going to have to content ourselves for now to just talk about it a little more clinically than I'd like to. But um, if you see at the beginning of chapter 25, if you have a heading there, it kind of gives you the idea. We're talking about building the tabernacle, this uh, mobile tent that will serve as the temple for them. Uh, um, I should say a mobile temple where God will dwell. So in verse 8, as they're receiving all these offerings to build it, he says, then have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. So let's let's not forget the bizarre, really, the bizarre nature of this statement that God, Yahweh, the king of uh, the glories of heavens and, uh, and earth, he dwells among the holy glorious beings of heaven. That's his company, right? Day in and day out, that's his company. And he decides to take a slave people, or very recently slave people, homeless, by the way, right? They're they're nomads now. They're living in tents with no home, nothing to call their own yet. Um, They would be poor except for the fact that the Egyptians gave them a bunch of stuff. So they, they got a little bit of wealth now. But they're nobodies. Honest to goodness, they're nobodies. And it's these people that he generously offers to come and dwell among them. And then think about the fact, as we've talked about before, in what kind of dwelling did he decide? He decided this, not the Israelites. It's not like the Israelites are saying, well, it's the best we can do, and given our circumstances, God himself gave them the idea and the blueprint to live in a tent? Man. This is weird, everybody. This is bizarre. The gods of the ancient world were understood to live on the high places, either in heaven itself, on the mountains. This is why they, they were, Israel was constantly chastised about the high places throughout the whole story, because that's where you go to worship the high beings. And here is Yahweh, the greatest of all the Elohim, and he comes down and he's like, I'm going to live with you in a desert. How long? Oops centuries not in the desert but centuries he's living with them so just uh, i don't want to walk by that as if it's hey you know god decided to live with them no it's like what god decided to live with them uh in exodus 29 he repeats this conviction and determination exodus 29 44 He's been talking about how to worship him properly and uh, the role of Aaron and the priesthood and and all of that. Again, talking about this tent he's going to live in. Look at verse 44 here. So uh, Exodus 29, 44. So I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am Yahweh their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am Yahweh their God. He actually, in this last statement here, tells us why he got them out of Egypt. It wasn't like a last minute decision like, oh, these poor sad people, I guess I better stay with them a little while. He said the reason I got them out of there in the first place was so that I could dwell with them. This is phenomenal. 
Uh, but I wanted to point this out. When you look at verse 45 and compare it to the Revelation language, Revelation 21, you can see this is a direct parallel. Not exactly a quote. Why it's, did they ever see him? They never saw God, right? No, uh, they would see the Ark of the, the Covenant, which was his greatest representation they had, but they wouldn't see him directly. Now Moses got to see his back, as it says. Now Moses and the elders, Moses, Aaron, and the elders actually got to go up on the mountain. It says they looked upon God, they didn't die, and then they ate some food. Okay. <laughs> now, did they see the fullness of his glory? No. He wouldn't even let Moses by himself see his full glory. So they saw something of God. Well, I don't know what that means, though. But no, the, the people at large, they saw the evidence of his being there. They, they heard the thunder. They heard the trumpets. They saw the cloud of darkness, the lightning. They, so they, they sensed his presence, but they never saw him himself. Um, so go, go, keep your finger here in Exodus. But it says in verse 3, let me read this again from Revelation 21.3. I heard a loud voice from the throne, presumably God, the Lamb perhaps. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. I'm coming back to Exodus now. I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. There is something in God's mind that connects his, if, if you can say, location, his, his dwelling location with his possession of a people. And this wouldn't be unique to him. This would be the way the ancients understood the gods. This is why there's a city that's devoted to a particular god back then. Because the temple of that god is here. We have a special place in that god's heart because this is where the god dwells in the temple and their idol. So this is God saying, if you're my people, I'm going to be dwelling with you. That's how this works. If I, if I want to call you mine, I will identify that by being with you in a very real way. So we see it in Exodus. It's repeated here in Revelation. That's still the way God is. And uh, I, I just love this. It's so beautiful. Okay, and then um, I'm just going to name a few. We don't have to turn to all these. In Numbers 5.3, I'll write it, God reiterates this. He's going to dwell among them in this camp of theirs. Uh, their camp where I will dwell among them, he says. And then in Numbers 35.34, God references, uh, he says, Do not defile the land where you live and where I dwell, for I, Yahweh, dwell among the Israelites. So he takes the land itself very seriously because that's the land where he dwells. This is, I mean, think about when Moses first encounters God at the burning bush. What did, what did Yahweh tell him to do because it was holy ground he was on? Right? That, that's what it means when God's in the house, so to speak. That's, that's how the land is viewed as holy because he, he's there now. So he points out, if I'm going to dwell in this land, it's holy. Treat it right. Don't mistreat it. He took the land so seriously, the fact that they did not give the land its proper Sabbaths was a part of his motivation in the exile of getting them out of there. Do you remember that? The 70 years of exile, God chalked it up to the number of Sabbaths that they had neglected the land. So he said, I'll get you out of there for 70 years. I'll let the land have its 70 years of Sabbath. Then I'll bring you back. That's how seriously God takes the land where he dwells because it's holy. Um, let's see. Okay, let's turn to this one. 1 Kings 8.27. Solomon the king, who is the son of David the king, uh, is allowed to build the temple for Yahweh. David wanted to, wasn't allowed to. But he had the vision for it. He had the designs in mind. He had already made some preparations before his son Solomon took over. When it's finally done and they're ready to um, commit the temple to Yahweh and kind of wait and see if he's going to accept it or not, to dedicate it, listen to what Solomon says in 1 Kings 8, 27. Let's see. 
Do we want to read any more than that? So yeah, go ahead. Would somebody read uh, verses 27 and 28? So this is 1 Kings 8, 27, 28. Would somebody read that for us? All right. Nancy's got it. But will God really live on earth? Why? Even the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Listen to my prayer and my request, O Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is making to you today. Actually, would you read verse 29 as well? May you watch over this temple both day and night, this place where you have said you would put your name. May you always hear the prayers I make toward this place. Solomon was wise, right? The wisest of all the peoples of the earth. And he asks, I think, a really legitimate question. As, as much as they've put work and, and wealth and all that into this, the question is, but will Yahweh really live on the earth? <laughs> Wait a minute. And then the, the, here is logic. Why is that hard to believe that Yahweh would live on the earth? Because the heavens themselves, or everyone, even the ancients, I mean, they're not idiots. They understand the vastness of the heavens to some extent. They're like, even the vastness of the heavens can't contain you. Are you going to come and live on this earth? Which, again, they didn't understand everything the way we do, I'm sure. But they knew the earth was little compared to the heavens. And you're going to live here? In this little building? <laughs> Woo! It's a good question, Solomon. It's a fair question. But what was the answer? Yep. And he's going to live in the smallest part of the building, too. I mean, the, the Holy of Holies was the small piece of the building. That's where his ark would be. Did you notice, though, in the couple of verses later, Solomon sees a connection between Yahweh living there and his putting his name there. Because the name of Yahweh represents his being, his whole self. So he puts his name there, and that's a way of speaking of his dwelling there. Yeah. I was just saying, you talked about that. It can't be like we think about God living there, because he doesn't need to sleep. And he, 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 he's everywhere. So, what part of him, or how is he there? And I think by name. Because he, he can't be, he can't stay in there all day. Like his entire being, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it just, matter of fact, it's probably, probably in a way or more than we can even fathom how that. But I, I don't think he's, he's in that little room. <laughs> <laughs> right. Where'd Yahweh go? Oh, he decided to. He <laughs> <laughs> decided to hold himself up. Yeah, yeah and, and of course we understand that God didn't leave his heaven to stick himself in this little building. So, yeah, you're right. What does it mean that he's living there if he is the God we understand him to be? And so you're right, a big part of this is the fact his name is there, which this also means, uh, listen to the way Solomon does that prayer, which we've looked at more carefully before, and he speaks of the people turning their attentions towards this building. So it becomes a focal point, and we humans do benefit from this, don't we? It becomes a focal point in the physical realm for people to understand God's nearness to them. So yeah, we do have to think through, what does it mean for God to live somewhere when he's the God... He was everywhere, yeah. So I don't even think it could have something to do with, like I said, there's a name and, and people in our thought process thinking he's living there because the big deal was when Christ died, the second he died, the curtain tore and allowed us to go in there. If, if he wouldn't have had a place that we could comprehend, it, it couldn't, couldn't do that or, or make us understand that. Had You're right. Something physical for us to understand and by understanding that's where he resides, lives, or that's where his address is in the IRS mm -hmm. uh, when that curtain tore we were able to go in there and it showed before that that only one time a year was a priest, one priest allowed to go in there so that helps us to understand and comprehend that part of it and then how awesome it is to be able to go directly to him now such a change. Yeah, so you're right. To have something to show us. This is this is how this is. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. No, that's what the poor priest had to be like preparing forever, and I had that rope tied around just in case mm -hmm. he didn't make it. 
if he was in the presence of God once a year, he didn't make it, they would just drag him out. Yeah, do you remember talking about this tradition of the high priest going in there? And it's said that they tied a rope around him in case he died from unworthiness, and then that way he's not stuck in there. <laughs> they can, isn't that sick but smart? I mean, you know, what else can you do? You're not going to go in there. Sure. And also remember the temple, and you think of the whole design of the temple, especially the one Solomon built, but this was there for the tabernacle to some extent. It was exclusive. It was an increasingly exclusive space. So as Bill brought up, in the holiest of holies, in the inner sanctum, one person once a year, by God's invitation, in that I don't know if I'd say less holy, but yeah, in the slightly less holy sanctum where only priests could be. Now, if you're in the Solomon temple, remember, it goes out from there to the Levites, and then it goes out to all the men of Israel, and then all the women of Israel, and then the Gentiles get their court. But you better not come any closer. We, Rome authorized them to kill people if they broke that rule. Um, so anyways, my, my point is this. For God to do something exclusive, he had to have a certain space. Because you can't just say, this whole country is off limits. He had to limit it to a space in order to be exclusive in his holiness like that. I was wondering if it could be because if there's a, when Christ came, when essentially he sent his Holy Spirit, Spirit lives in us, yeah. but doesn't physically live in us. But just in the same, God lived, lived there, so he had some kind of contact with him. Yes. That's good. His, his, so he's present, not to say that all of him is here now so that he's nowhere else. Yeah. Yeah. So the progression, just to, just to remind you, there you are. The progression is, uh, biblically speaking, God dwells in heaven. That was understood. And then we find that God dwells in a tabernacle. And then we found that God was dwelling in the temple that kind of took the place of this. So I'm going to put these together. And then we see Jesus is the temple of God. Uh, his body is the temple, it says in John. When he said, tear down this temple, I'll rebuild it in three days. And everyone's like, uh, excuse me, it's taken decades to build this thing. And then John gives us his commentary. Not until later did the disciples realize, oh, he's talking about the temple that is his body. And then we find that when... Jesus returns to the Father. He sends his Holy Spirit, like Cecilia said, and now it's the church, as we looked at last time, is the living temple of God himself through the Holy Spirit. Now, what we're seeing in Revelation tells us something now. Where, where will God dwell in the new creation? Yep, the new earth in a new Jerusalem. So, from where does the new Jerusalem come? Heaven. You can just wrap it up and put a little bow on it. I mean, this is this is the whole story of God's dwelling, specifically speaking of his dwelling. Now, of course, all the way through here, he's still dwell, dwelling in heaven. He's still on the throne of heaven in a very real way. But in terms of his accessible, and I like the way you put that, Cecilia, his accessible presence has a storyline to it. And that's, that's really what we're investigating here. Um, in 1 Chronicles 23, 25, David makes this comment that I think is, is very applicable to our study right now in, in the new creation. David declared that the God of Israel, Yahweh, had come to dwell in Jerusalem forever. Now, is that technically true? No, <laughs> not the way David's talking about the earthly Jerusalem. God did not dwell there forever. In fact, we see in the book of Ezekiel, the prophet, God's glory gets up and leaves. And the people of Israel were waiting for him to return. The prophets had never said, okay, Yahweh officially came back. They were waiting for the other shoe to drop. When is he going to come back? His glory. And they, they kind of understood... Um, the, the, the presence of God in the temple was different. 
they didn't have the temple they used to have. They didn't have the Ark of the Covenant anymore. They understood something dramatically shifted after they had lost their temple before. Because God had left, he said, through Ezekiel. And they never got official word that he's back yet. So it's strange that David would say that Yahweh said he will dwell there forever. So one of two things I think we have to conclude. Either one, God changed his mind and is like, nah, never mind. <laughs> you went too far, I'm out. Or the forever nature of this is uh, fully fulfilled in some other way. Now, knowing what we know so far of Revelation, that sounds right, doesn't it? The full fulfillment coming differently than you might expect. That's the story of the New Testament, the New Covenant. Things are being fulfilled in a much bigger, more glorious way than we could have thought based on the original promises. So when, when we hear about God coming to dwell in J Jerusalem forever and you look at the storyline, you're like, nope, that didn't happen. Well, well, wait a minute. I'm getting to Revelation 21 and I'm like, okay, it's true. Forever, for the, the ages to come, God will dwell there. Um, let's see. I, I was looking at this because to me, this is just a reminder of, of the sweetness of what we're talking about. I'm just going to put a list of psalms up here uh, for you to investigate, if you like, on your own. But I, I want to I summarize them for you, why I grouped them together. In Psalm 23.6, somebody might be able to tell me, at the end of the Psalm 23 passage that is so familiar to people, what does the psalmist say? And I will dwell in the Lord forever. Now think about that, because this is David, the same one who made that statement I just mentioned. I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. How is that possible when he's immortal and he's not allowed to live in the temple? He's not a priest. And by the way, there's no temple. There, I guess tabernacle, like we would say for David. He's not allowed to live in the tabernacle. He's the wrong kind of person. He's a king, not a priest. So why would he say, I will dwell in Yahweh's house forever? Unless he had some other idea of what that means. right? So anyways, I just wanted to point that out. That goes along with what he said back in First Chronicles. In 27.4, we get the same idea. In 61.4 and in 84.10. These are various examples where the psalmist is expressing this great desire to be in, to dwell in, to have access to the temple of Yahweh or the, the tabernacle of Yahweh where he dwells. There is this very famous song that's based on this really sweet psalm that says, uh, better is one day in your house than, anybody know? Than thousands elsewhere. I mean, think about that. I would take one day in your presence at your house over a thousand anywhere else on earth. That's a pretty big statement because there are some fantastic places in the world. Give me a thousand days. Man, that's like three years. I'll take that. The psalmist was like, no, 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 but I know something about your house, your presence. It's sweeter than three years anywhere else. Like, what? How romantic is that? You know, if any ladies or gentlemen, if somebody came to you and was like, you know what, darling? I'd rather spend one day with you than three days with three years with anybody else. Oh. You know, like, this is, this is real. <laughs> I'm going to feed Mark that line. Mark's going to come to you someday and like, read, read this note. Well, it fits me, so. <laughs> Hallmark <laughs> That's right. Biblical romance right there. Um, yeah. I'm cheating with him to put that, but at the end of Ezekiel 37, there's also mention of the 12 place being one of the throne. Yes, we're going to get there. I think you're... Actually, I don't know that I have that one. Maybe keep, keep that one on, on deck, because we're going to be getting to uh, some of the prophets in just a minute. Very good. Um, yeah, there, there's another statement in the Psalms that I think is really sweet, which is that the psalmist is envying the birds because the birds get to make their nest in the dwelling place of Yahweh. And he's like, here I am, having to look longingly from the outside, but the birds get to go over there and nest and be there. He's like, oh man, I wish I was like a bird. <laughs> you see the, do you see the sweetness of that? This, this pining away for something that's not, not accessible to me. 
And now we're seeing in Revelation 21, the desire of every righteous person's heart is going to be fulfilled. He will dwell among his people. You're not locked out. Yeah, it's fantastic. And then, uh, this is really sweet. Psalm 68, 15 to 17. Okay, a little background real quick here. In fact, let's turn there. Psalm 68, just so you can see the language of this. Psalm 68, 15 to 17. Okay. <laughs> so great. Uh, everybody there? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mount Bashan, majestic mountain. Mount Bashan, rugged mountain. Why gaze in envy, you rugged mountain, at the mountain where God chooses to reign where Yahweh himself will dwell. How long? Forever. We keep seeing this language of forever. How can that make sense? The chariots of God are tens of thousands and thousands of thousands. The Lord has come from Sinai into his sanctuary. There are three mountains listed here. And I just want to talk about this just because it shows the tremendous wonder of the Jerusalem event. So we have Bashan, talk about that in a second. We have Zion, and we have Sinai. Three mountains. Why does he speak to Bashan? Why, why is Bashan a thing here? So Bashan was understood to be the, a, a very important high place for the false gods. And so uh, one of the more important pagan gods dwelled there and reigned from Bashan. So think about this. Think about what the psalmist is saying. Think about the fighting words of the psalmist here. Oh, Bashan, you get to be the, the mountain and the place of, of rule for that God? Oh, no wonder you envy. Think about this. No wonder you envy the mountain where God chose. Because you got that second-rate God over there on you. The true God gets to reign on Mount Zion. It would be like if I went up to someone's, someone's wife. And I was like, oh, why are you envying my wife? Why are you envying my wife? Is it because I'm so much better than, than you are for your wife, right? So this, this is totally a statement when he speaks of Basham this way, of the supremacy of the true God. And how the other God must be so envious, or the mountain of the other God must be so envious that it's got to settle for being the mountain of that God over there, right? So he mentions Zion where God has cho chosen to dwell. But notice he also brought up Sinai. What did he say about Sinai? The Lord has come from Sinai into his sanctuary. Where is his sanctuary? On which mountain? Sinai. Why does he mention Sinai? That was the mountain of God. That's why he meets Moses there. He calls it the mountain of God. That's why he takes him there for the covenant ceremony with Israel. That's the mountain of God. And this is why God said, I, I'll choose a place in the future where I'll put my name. As if to say, I'm moving residences. This is phenomenal. This is amazing. And so, Bashan, you should be envious of Zion. Oh, Sinai, you're probably feeling envious too because Yahweh left you to come over here to his sanctuary here in Zion. I, I'm just trying to paint the picture. When we walk on by the Jerusalem thing, because that's old, old stuff, we're missing something wonderful. The Jewish people, I think, had something here. It was inferior to the fullness and that's why God wanted to give them the fullness through Jesus. But it was so good. It was so wonderful. And there's so many other psalms that we could look to in which this love and this affection and this reverence for, for Jerusalem is in the hearts of the righteous ones. Um, in Joel 3.17... In fact, before we go to Joel, I'm out of order because... Um, Hector brought one up from Ezekiel, which comes before Joel. So let me ask Hector 
tell us again what you were referring to in Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel 37. Get started at 26. Okay, let's take a look at that. I will not pretend like I got everything there is, so I'm glad when you all bring things up I've missed. 37, 26, okay. Oh, yes, this is sweet. Very good. In fact, let me start back in verse 24. I think you'll hear some language here that uh, definitely reminds you of our new covenant fulfillment of things. So this is Ezekiel 37, 24. My servant David will be king over them. Now, of course, this either is a reference to David's reincarnation no. Or he's speaking of the house of David, someone in his descend, line of descendants. My servant David will be king over them, and they will have one shepherd. Why one shepherd? Why is that such a big deal? Because for so much of Israel's history, they've had two kings over two nations, right? The split nation. This is a promise of unification. He will unify his people. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob the land where your ancestors lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there, how long? Forever. Oh. And David, my servant, will be their prince. How long? Forever. Yeah. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. There's a lot of eternal things being described here. I will establish them and increase their number, and I will put my sanctuary, I will put my sanctuary among them. How long? Forever. Hello. And my dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Does this sound like Revelation 21? <laughs> then the nations will know that I, Yahweh, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. So thank you very much for pointing that passage out. That is sweet. Ooh, I'm getting all kinds of goose pimples. Okay, <laughs> so that's Ezekiel. Now let's go to Joel 3.17. I'm really just trying to show you what I could summarize in two sentences, but it's so much better to see it, I think, for yourself. Ah, nuts. What did I do? Let's see. I got a number wrong. 417. Thank you. 417. No. Joel only has three. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. He, yeah, he's got a different numbering system in his okay. his version. Yeah. So it is Joel three seventeen in our NIV and the tr more common Bibles here. All right. Uh, I actually want to read a little bit more of this because I think you'll see some other connections to Revelation, and that's what we're looking for. Would somebody read <coughs> verses twelve? to 12 to 21. Let's just do it, man. This is so good. Anybody want to read that big chunk? 12 to 21. Listen to the parallels to Revelation here. Anybody? Joel 3. Did somebody say? Okay, go for it, Sue. Let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, yeah. Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come trample the grapes, for the winepress is full, and the vats are overflow. So great is their wickedness. Multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will be darkened, and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem, and earth and heavens will tremble. But the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. Keep going. Yeah, all the way through the end of the chapter. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. In that day, the mountains will drip new wine, and the hills will flow with milk, and the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acre. What is that? Acacias. Acacias. 
but Egypt will be desolate, Edom the desert waste, because of violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhibited forever, and Jerusalem through all generations. Shall I leave their innocent blood unavenged? No, I will not. The Lord dwells in Zion. There's like every sentence had a parallel in Revelation. Did you notice it? Okay, let's review. This is so fantastic. Uh, number one, judging all the nations. Yep. How about this? Swinging the sickle, yeah. harvesting grapes, and pressing them in the vats. Oh, are you kidding me? It's like point for point, right? Um, of course, the day of Yahweh and decision-making for the nations. And then the, the chaos of creation. Sun and moon darkened, stars no longer shining. And then this language of uh, Yahweh on his throne in heaven. In Revelation, you hear a lot about the, the loud sounds and the earthquake and the, the lightning. And it says, uh, Yahweh roars from Zion, thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and heavens tremble. Yahweh will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of, of Israel. And then notice as he talks about living in Zion again with his people and the, the prosperity for his people. By the way, a river coming from the throne of God, that's in the Revelation, just like we see here, uh, a fountain flowing out from Yahweh. But then look at verse, verse 19. Amidst all the joyful promises for his people, what is there? Dude. This terrible uh, judgment and wrath that's going to come on the enemies of his people, and how did they treat his people? They shed their blood. And God is avenging the innocent. Does that sound like the revelation to you? And how does the whole thing end? Yahweh dwells in Zion. Because in, in the new creation, what did we find out? Yahweh dwells among his people in the new Jerusalem, the Zion. <laughs> hey, thank you, Joel. Joel had a whole lot of this already given to him so long ago. Uh, how about Zechariah 8.3? I'm getting a little low on the board. Sorry if you can't see that there. But Zechariah 8.3. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start in verse 1 here. If you remember the, the phrase in the NIV, Lord Almighty, that's Yahweh of the hosts. Okay, that's how I'm going to read it. The word of Yahweh of the hosts came to me. This is what Yahweh of the hosts says. I am very jealous for Zion. I am burning with jealousy for her. This is what Yahweh says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city. And the mountain of Yahweh of the hosts will be called the holy mountain. This is what Yahweh of the hosts says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each of them with cane in hand because of their age. The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. This is what Yahweh of the hosts says. It may seem marvelous to the remnant of this people at that time, but it will seem, what will it seem marvelous to me? Declares Yahweh of the hosts. So the idea again that God uh, had abandoned J Jerusalem because of the wickedness of the people, but he promises to come back and to bring the joy and the prosperity and the security of his city back for his people. It's just a constantly running theme. God's heart for Jerusalem never, never faded. Um, now I'm going to go backwards in the, the lineup of prophets, but Jeremiah 24-7 This is actually one of a whole bunch, and I'm not going to uh, go, go through all of these. But this is a, a theme in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And actually, maybe... Okay, I thought I had the Ezekiel in here. It's because I, I grouped it with this particular one. Um, but I'm glad we read it, because that was worth it. Actually, I put three stars next to it to remind myself to read it. <laughs> but you get three stars, three gold stars, yeah. Um, so let's read this, Jeremiah 24, 7. Like I say, there's a bunch that go along with this that kind of repeat this refrain here. Okay. Let's see here. Let me start at verse 4. The word of Yahweh came to me, Jeremiah speaking. 
This is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says. Like these good figs, I regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I sent away from this place to the land of the Babylonians. My eyes will watch over them for their good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know me, that I am Yahweh. They will be my people, and I will be their God, for they will return to me with all their heart. So all these verses that I could, I could list for you, they all have this theme of, they will be my people, I will be their God. That's what we're seeing in Revelation. So it's this return to Yahweh claiming this people for himself and dwelling among them to prove it. Okay, so I want to take that walk through the Old Covenant Scriptures with you to show, again, this is not John having this novel idea on the island. This is Yahweh saying, all that stuff I told you, all those promises I made, here it comes. It's going to be done. You know, you think about it, it, it's absolutely awesome to see how, how much he wants to be our God. Yes. So he just wavers in and do anything. But he has that desire, he's always had that desire for us to be his people and to be our God. Our yes. only. Amen. It, it must be such a desire for him. Because he's gone through a lot of trouble for all this to happen. Right? I mean, his son suffered her horrifically. His holy ones have suffered horrifically. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. By the way, I think what Yahweh said to Moses about his liberating Israel from Egypt, I, I think we could very safely and very confidently say that that same language can transfer to the holy ones under Jesus. So let's compare Egypt to sin, which I don't think is a stretch. <laughs> uh, that's a biblical pattern. So if, if God, Yahweh, has rescued people out of the grip of sin, Satan, and death, which we know that's true, through Jesus, couldn't we very well say, what was it? Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't write it down. But, so I'll paraphrase. Can't we confidently say that... that it would, it would be a, a fair thing to say, I should say, that Yahweh would say, the reason I rescued all of those folks out of sin, the grip of Satan and of death, was so that I might dwell among them. Why could we safely say that? Because we've seen in the Revelation that Jesus purchased a people for his God to serve as a kingdom and priests. All, all, the salvation story in the Revelation is clear. And then you get to the end of Revelation and you realize, so that's why you did this? so that your new Jerusalem could come down where this whole world is populated by your saved ones, just like Israel was to be populated by the rescued ones from Egypt, right? And you wanted to live with us? So yeah, the wonder of this, this is the whole reason he did all of this, was to dwell among his people. That's like, kind of in, like an overview of Ezekiel 16. Of what? Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16. How he took Israel from her sisters and how she was corrupted and things like that, and man, because he'll remember her youth, and he remembers, and at the end, he, uh, he will be their God. Yeah. And this is a, it's a very interesting picture, but it's... It's a graphic of, parable, yeah, too, it is, yeah. But it is, it is very akin to, you know, we've taken out of sin, slavery, you know, systems like, you know, Edom or Egypt, you know, and yes. Sodom and things, things we did before, like in Christ, and he was waiting there so he could claim us. Yeah, and, and that parable is so beautiful because it shows that uh, Israel was not cooperative in the process. She got all proud. She got all up and, you know, because God had treated her so well, she got all proud of that. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he stuck with her. Anybody testify? That's our story too. Yeah, the, think about the church's story. All the blessings we got from God made us real arrogant, and then we did some horrible things collectively. I don't mean each individual. And, and he's stuck with us, even though we have not deserved that well. All right. So what I want to do now, I want to uh, turn the page, literally, in my notebook, but t turn the page also in, in looking at the next verse uh, in Revelation 21. So he has prepared for himself this beautiful bride, and he will dwell with her, 
meaning Jerusalem, which is representative of his people. And verse 4. Ooh, we love this, don't we? Oh, come on now. This is one of the most quoted verses in the entire Revelation. <laughs> Just about every funeral I've ever attended, this is read. Whenever you want to remind yourself all this nonsense in this world won't last forever, you come back to this verse. We need this picture. But I want to look a little more carefully at it. Because I think there's more to this than perhaps an uh, initial glance. Surprise, surprise. He, who is the he, by the way? Well, the antecedent is God, right? Because he's going to dwell among his people. He'll be their God. He, God, will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be, listen now, come on. I know you know this, but come on. There will be no more death. death. There will be no more mourning. You say sorrow. Fair, that's a good word too. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. Why is that? Because the old order <clears throat> has passed away. It's the entirety of the old thing is gone, so the entirety of the new thing can come. What we're looking at right now in this vision is a completion of something. So when Jesus came in the, in the flesh, human mortal flesh, with the announcement of the kingdom of God's arrival, at hand, among us, all those things, we knew that something was, was shifting, cosmically shifting for the people of earth. When Jesus was raised from the dead forever, that was the first glimpse at what the new creation would ultimately be. Now, all the miracles of Jesus were giving us temporary glimpses at what the new creation would be. So dead people are being raised to life. What does that tell you? No more death. Sick people are being healed. What does that tell you? No more sickness. Hungry people are being fed. What does that tell you? No more hunger. So there are all these little temporary glimpses. But the problem is they're temporary. That dead guy who came back to life is going to die again. Sorry, Lazarus. Those hungry people who were fed are going to be hungry again. He had to feed 4,000 later. Maybe some of the same people. Um, sick people are going to probably get sick and die again. Right? All those things. The, the, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead forever was the first new creation event for the actual new creation in the physical realm. Because that is the only eternal change so far in the physical realm. What we're seeing is the end of a process of mingled old and new creation. From Jesus till, till this moment we're reading, the passing of the old creation, it's a mingled situation. Old and new creations are, are mixed in together. So, for instance, you sitting here as a disciple of Jesus, you are a mixture of your own self. Because your inner self is the new creation. We've talked about this. Your physical self is a part of, it's anchored to the old creation. It's got to die. You yourself are a mixture of old and new creation. Thank God the new creation wins. Amen. Okay. But you're, you're living with that tension right now. But that's the world too. You've got new created people living with not, old creation people in the mix. What we're looking at now is that, is that moment in time where we can actually finally see it. All of the old is done. There's no mixture anymore. It's all holy. It's all pure. It's all righteous. Oh. So the old is gone. Now, the evidence of the old being gone is that the symptoms of the old are gone. Thank God it's not just in remission. Amen. <laughs> it just didn't go underground to wait to pop up again later. This cancer is cured. What are the symptoms? He said, no more death, no more crying, mourning, crying, or pain. But before he gets to the no, no, no's, he says something that to the, the prophetically minded person sounds super familiar. He says he will wipe every tear from their eyes. I think that's the summary statement. What comes next, this list of four no's, is the, is the bit more of the explicit. So, does anyone, would anyone happen to know, and maybe you have a footnote in your Bible that tells you this, from where does this line, he will wipe every tear from their eyes, where is that rooted in the prophetic literature? Isaiah, Isaiah 25, 8. All right. Thank you, footnotes. I love this. Okay. Let me... 
35, Hopefully everyone's got this that needs it. Because it's gone. The old order is gone. So in Isaiah 25, what verse did you say? 18. We need to turn there, so go ahead, get ahead of me. Because, uh, oops, this is one of the new creation promises of the old covenant that is hard to ignore. And again, you're like, well, so did John just imagine this? Did he just come up with this? Is this a new revelation God's giving out of the blue that there'll be no more death one day? Nope. Uh, centuries before even Jesus walked in mortal flesh, God had already shown his cards. He was already planning this. Isaiah 25, I'm going to start in verse 6. In fact, would somebody else like to read? Uh, 6 to 8. Isaiah 25, 6 to 8. Brother Joe, you've got it. On the mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all people. A banquet of good wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people to sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove people's disgrace from all the earth. Yahweh has spoken. <laughs> oh man, that, that just phrase makes me happy. Okay, so in this passage we saw uh, several things. Number one, death, tears, disgrace. I wanted to write these on the board because as we move forward with this statement in Revelation 21, I think we'll see an interesting pattern here. All these connections to the Old Covenant are still happening in the Revelation. What's the first thing, after mentioning that the tears will be wiped away, what's the first thing in Revelation 21 that John says will be no more? Yeah. Death. Interesting. He quotes Isaiah 25, and then he brings the Isaiah 25 promise out to the forefront. And did you notice the beautiful poetic language of this? What did, what did Isaiah refer to as death? <coughs> He says, the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. Paul agreed with this. Death reigned from the time of Adam. The idea that de death was this undefeatable enemy, and it just takes everybody. It takes everybody. In fact, the wisdom literature of the scriptures refers to death in Hades as, as being uh, an appetite that can't be satisfied. It's just always gobbling up more and more. It never is done. It never has enough. Yeah. Because in each new generation of humanity, what does death keep doing? Gobble them up too. Another, another crop comes up, gobble them up too. It's never done. Wouldn't that be great if like last generation death was like, oh, oh. I'll give you guys a break for 200 years. I got to digest this. No, just continually consumes every human being that arrives on the scene. Of course, there's a question about um, Enoch. He was taken away and he was no more, whatever that means. And then, uh, who was the other one that it appears didn't die? Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Was it? Elijah. Elijah was taken it up into the sky or into a heaven, and we lose track of him. Many would assume, therefore, he didn't die. It never actually says that, I don't think. Seems fair enough. But he was just taken away? The world would have yeah, so a whirlwind separate. Yeah, the chariot separates him from Elisha, and then a whirlwind takes him. Yeah. What a weird thing to see, <laughs> Master. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think too, you know, we, we all the Bible talks about death as being separation from God. You know, and so no more death. There's no more chance of ever being separated from God again, too. Yeah, and actually, I would expand that not just from God. Death is separation from each other, too. Like, when you're removed from the land of the living, everyone that knows you lost you. That's why we say, sorry for your loss. That's what this is about. I'm separated from you. I can't. That's why we long to see them. We long to hear their voice. 
that that separation is what death ultimately means. Very good. So it's certainly the ultimate death is separation from God, but death generally is just separation. Yeah. You talk about the tears too, and, and Revelation seven seventeen talks about wiping away the tears. Good. When we get to tears, bring that up again, because yeah, this is another quote, right? Very good. Um, I want to take kind of a Okay, surprisingly, a, a slower look at these different ingredients in Revelation 21. So the first one is death. Uh, before we... Oh, no, you know what? What Bill just brought up is what we want to look at first, because it's the statement that he wipes every, uh, uh, tears from all the eyes. So I asked you to wait until we're there. We're there now. So, okay. This is in... Yeah, three gold stars. This is in Revelation 7. Uh, I do want to read more than verse 17, though that's where the, the statement is made. I want to get some context. Who are we talking about? Uh, so, again, Revelation 7. I'm going to read a chunk here just to review because this is such a beautiful vision. Revelation 7. This is after the first cycle, or uh, sorry, this is in the middle of the first cycle of wrath visions of holy ones, and then the completion of all things. So in chapter 6, we saw six of the seals are opened on that scroll, and then we get a snapshot of two groups of holy ones. The first group is the 144,000 that are sealed from the 12 tribes of Israel. Twelve kind of, right? We looked at that. And then let's start in verse 9 with me. The second group of holy ones he sees. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? John says, I answered, sir, you know. And the elder said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, when you hear they've come out of the Great Tribulation, you're either thinking of the Great Tribulation in the last several years of Earth, or you're thinking, which this is what I think, you're thinking of the Great Tribulation that has gone through the whole story, which I think the Revelation has shown us that. But anyway, uh, how select a group is this, is the question. Therefore, they, they who have come out of that Great Tribulation are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple. Who serves in the temple day and night? The priests, another vision of the priesthood. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This whole thing about what awaits those who come out of the Great Tribulation is prophecy after prophecy after prophecy from the Old Covenant confirmed. So, as, as Bill pointed out, here we see again the Isaiah 25 promise applied to the righteous and holy and faithful ones who are willing to suffer rather than turn away from their covenant with, with God and with Christ. Okay, so I wanted to talk about... Sorry, before we leave this idea of wiping with the tears... Who is said to do it? God. Who is said to wipe away the tears? God. 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 Jesus. Can you... What? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> because if you think about it, he didn't... It, it, there's, you don't get the idea that it's a, a collective tear he's wiping away. When he says, again, how, how literally do you take this? But I don't know. He's painting the picture for a reason. This is a very personal thing. He could send out his angels. You know, everybody, all you angels, take four humans, wipe the tears away, and we'll be done. But he, he makes this personal on purpose. He himself will do this for his people. 
That's how much he loves them. And that goes hand in hand with the idea of wanting to dwell with them. This personal connection is so profoundly important to him. All right, so let's talk about death, going away. I like talking about death when we talk about it going away, right? We looked at Isaiah 25, 7 to 8. Uh, I wanted to just, for the sake of time, I'm just kind of going to run through some of these uh, rather than turn and talk at length about each of them. But I want to make sure I write them down for you so you have them to compare. In Romans 6, verse 9, a beautiful statement by Paul. Uh, Since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. That is the first shot across the bow to death by God saying, it's coming. Your demise is coming. See, I already did it for my son, and I'll do it for all of them soon. Death got the first glimpse that, uh uh-oh, I couldn't hold on to Jesus. That means I'm going to have to let go of all of them soon. Woo! So uh, we also saw this in the book of Acts, though. I think it was Peter who said, uh, death could not hold him. Well, that's right. Because God is, again, shot heard around the world. God's telling death, your grip is loosening, bud. You're losing your touch. <laughs> Jesus holds the keys of death in Hades, right? First uh, Corinthians fifteen twenty six. Paul says that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And uh, that's something we've already seen fulfilled in the vision. In 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 55, this is again, this is a quote from the Old Covenant. Surprise, surprise. Then, meaning when all of this is accomplished, then the saying will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Amen. Jesus took the sting out. 2 Timothy 1.10. Christ Jesus, listen to this language, oh, Whew. Christ Jesus who has destroyed death, wait a minute, you're going to have to think through that one as a disciple because that's past tense, it seems like death is still rearing pretty hard right now, you know what I mean, like death is still gobbling people up to use that metaphor, so what does he mean that he destroyed death, let me finish the sentence, Christ Jesus who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. In other words, what Paul is saying is not that death is done entirely yet. What he's saying is the death knell has already been announced. Why? Because in the gospel of Jesus, the, the way to immortality has been made known. It's been made clear. It's been brought to light. See, up till then, and if you look through the Jewish writings up to the time of Jesus... There is an idea of an afterlife, but there's nothing super clear on how all this works. What Paul is saying is now there's clarity about life and immortality because of Jesus and his gospel. You could only guess at it because you'd never seen it before. No one had ever seen death defeated before like this. As soon as Jesus was raised from the dead, clarity. Well, that's how this works. You look to Jesus and his immortal body and you're, a lot of your questions are answered. Number one, am I going to be resurrected with an actual body? Yep. Uh, Will I look anything like I do now? Apparently so. Will I be able to eat food? You betcha. You know, all this stuff. Uh, We we now have immortality brought to light because of Jesus. So is death already destroyed totally? No. I think that's an anticipatory. He destroyed death, meaning it's clear it's going to happen now. Um, Hebrews 2. Oh, this is fantastic. Hebrews 2. 14 to 15. Jesus broke the power of him who holds the power of death, which is the devil, and he frees those who all their lives are held in slavery by their fear of death. Jesus' conquest over death now allows him to go to every human being who always lives under the sheet of death. Everyone's got the cloud over them that knows it's coming. And some would say that that's good. And by the way, just to throw a little commentary, if you don't mind, in a lot of storytelling I've experienced, whether on screen or in literature, 
as, as humans try to work through how to deal with death, I'm always fascinated because Jesus has made it clear to me, but that doesn't mean it's clear to everybody. And I always try to, I always try to find my, my gratitude in, but what if I didn't have this? And the only way for me to know what if I didn't have it was to think about what others say, because I can't erase my memory of what he showed me, right? But anyways, I find it fascinating when people show death and they try to help people cope with death, they'll say things that sound really insightful but are awful. One of those things is that death makes life meaningful. In other words, the only reason that we embrace life is because we know it will end eventually. And again, I think through that, I'm like, you know, maybe because uh, knowing that I only have a limited amount of time with you maybe helps me appreciate you more. And if you've ever known someone where they've been given a, a time frame of how long they can live by a doctor, it is true, it kind of kicks you into gear to appreciate what time you have with them. But then I thought to myself, that's like saying that light can't exist without darkness. Life has no meaning without death. I thought that is a very, forgive, forgive the harshness of this, is a very ignorant way to view life because it's missing some key knowledge. Let me ask you this, was there light before darkness? Yes. Not in the, as far as we know, not in the uh, natural, uh, physical area, because there was darkness and he said, let there be light. But what do we assume about God? Was he darkness or light? light. Yeah, right? So the light of God has always existed. Darkness doesn't have to exist. Light does. Same thing with, with life and death. How can you pretend like, almost like it's a yin-yang thing? Life is good because death is there. Gag! If that's true, then Paul doesn't call death an enemy that needs destroying. Death isn't this friend that helps us appreciate. Death is a, is a plague. It's a cancer. It needs to go. And that's something Jesus brought to the table. Everyone knows death is hard, but then when you try to work through, so what do we do about that? We're like, well, let's just think about it differently. It helps us appreciate life. And Jesus is standing over here going, nope. <coughs> It needs to die, you know? It's an enemy. So anyways, I just wanted to bring that up because you're going to hear things that are very sophisticated and deep, but they can still be really wrong. They're sentimental. You might want to post it on Facebook because it's sweet. But just remember, we have an actual truth that anchors us. We can see through a lot of these ideas that other people couldn't see through because they don't know the real deal. So we can be grateful. You're saying about, about light and then mm -hmm. what I'd like to... Like there's two places that refer to that. You know, in the very beginning, in Genesis, you know, God created heaven and earth, the earth was up for a void. Darkness fell upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of waters and said, Let there be light, and there was light. But he didn't create the sun until the fourth day. Right. So the light was there, it was God. And in Revelation, I don't know exactly where it talks about, we will never leave a light because of God's light. That's really a big deal. Yes. Which makes me, that's what makes me think, darkness is not necessary, light is. <laughs> yeah. Now, of course, for our health and sanity, darkness is helpful, for physically, but I'm talking about in the ultimate sense, right? If you, I don't know if anyone here would have, but if you've ever talked to someone who's lived in those high northern places, does that happen? I'm guessing it happens, no. Anyway, but when, when the day just never ends, constant light, that is not good for us, right? But spiritually speaking, darkness is not necessary. It will go away. The sun's not good for us either. What's that? The sun burns, cancer. All yeah, time. right? Too much of that is, yeah. is not a good but thing. Vegetables grow big when it's yeah. <laughs> Very robust plant life. Um, so with the little time we have left, just wanted to finish these, these uh, passages I have for you. Just to remind you what it says in Revelation. Revelation 1.8. I reference this a whole lot because I think it's fantastic. But Jesus says of himself that he holds the keys of death and Hades, y'all. And then in Revelation 2.11, those who conquer will not be hurt at all by the second death, which is where death dies. Revelation 20, verse 6, The second death has no power over those who experience the first resurrection. As controversial as that is, we know at least that's true. And then in 20 verse 14 is the picture of all those promises being kept. Because who, who's the last 
pair to be thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Of all the, the villains in the story. Death and the grave. Death in the grave. Death in Hades. Done. Death dies. The final enemy to be destroyed is death. So, when we read that death is no more, I, I just want to make sure we realize this isn't just a, a subtle shift into something different. This is a decisive conquest, a decisive victory over an actual enemy. That's the way the scriptures portray it. Uh, it's not just we wake up one day and no more people die. Oh, I wonder what's happening. Uh, what's going on here? No, we'll know why it's not happening anymore. God won a victory here. He took down the most undefeatable enemy humankind has ever known. Maybe except for taxes. But even people evade taxes. But people can't evade death. It'll always come. It always gets a hold of you and won't let go until God said, time to let go. God wins. Now, this is our message to the world. Right? We have so much to share with the world about real knowledge, real understanding of reality. And it's good, and it's exciting, and it actually answers real things they're experiencing. This isn't esoteric, you know, stuff in heaven. Everybody's experiencing death to some level. And we get to, maybe not the moment it happens, but we get to help people have a, a, a real vision of death that's realistic and say, it is an enemy. And let's not pretend that when people experience death, it's like, oh, it's fine. Death's, death's a friend. It takes us to a better place. That's not really what the scriptures have us do. Scriptures have us acknowledge, this is awful. What's happening is awful. This is not the way God wanted things to be, designed things to be. But don't forget also, he's going to beat this. This isn't how it will always be. He's going to win that victory. Jesus proved it. You know, that, that's meaningful. That's not just... Hallmark sentiment. Yeah. Do you think that, and I don't know why, uh, but maybe when when Christ when Christ died, maybe what God was trying to show people was that there there is life after death because all the tombs broke open and all the dead, well, certain some of the righteous dead, yeah, went through all through the city, and people are going to be looking at us saying, "What?" <laughs> They weren't really dead. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so that, that's a great follow-up to something Jesus had said before all that happened. If you remember, he was challenged by the Sadducees about resurrection. And they were trying to bring up a scenario that proved how silly this whole resurrection idea was. Do you remember this? And he said, let's say there's a lady who married a guy. Yeah. And he died before they had kids. And so they married the brother. He died. And it kept happening. How many brothers all together? Seven. Seven, Seven brothers, right? So then there's, I, I can just imagine the smirk on their face when they ask, so at the resurrection that you all Pharisees believe in, uh, whose wife is she going to be? <laughs> you know, I just imagine, this is so stupid. <laughs> and Jesus, of course, you can't, you can't outwit Jesus. And he comes back and he brings up the idea that at the resurrection you aren't married or given in marriage. But as if to show them how silly they are for not acknowledging the resurrection, he goes to God's encounter with Moses when God says to Moses, I'm the God of your fathers, who? Abraham, Abraham Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus points out something that, once he says it, it's kind of obvious, but I'd miss it. He said, now, uh, if he speaks of them in the present tense as if they're alive, because God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus is already saying to them, Death does not mean the end of all life. It means the end of physical life. And so now he's setting them up to say, but that's not all there is either. And again, this is something we as disciples can offer people. A lot of people are willing to accept the idea that after you die, your spirit goes somewhere nice. They're in a better place, all that stuff. But that's not even all the hope we can offer people. Your spirit goes somewhere nice. We actually get to share with them the final detail of all this, which is you're going to get another body. And I need to tell you something. When people think about the future after death and all they think about is a wispy existence of spirit, that's actually a little bit scary. That's different. We don't understand that. That's not who we are created to be, S wispy spirit things. We were designed to be bodily. That's a part of our actual species, right, that God put together. Without that last piece of the puzzle, 
it'll always seem like there's something amiss. But God didn't want it to be amiss. He wanted to bring it to its full completion. And he said, I'm going to give you another body. So how is it possible, we'll end here, how is it possible that death can finally die if we're going to keep on living eternally in a body? And the answer is, we're going to have a different kind of body. And this is where Revel or 1 Corinthians 15 comes in so handy. 1 Corinthians 15 is the longest and most detailed exploration of resurrection in the entire Bible. Paul goes through questions of what kind of body will it be and all of this stuff. And so what do we know? Let's turn to, as we end, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to have a picture of what it means that death is done. 1 Corinthians 15. No, he doesn't talk about it there. Um, even for pleasure. I don't have to look, at, look into that one. Because Paul knows there's a lot of questions about this. And I'm not sure that he had total clarity either, but what he had, he offered here. Um, let's see. Do -do -do. Let's go to verse 35. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35. And then we'll close out for tonight. But someone will ask, and of course they will, right? This is, this is a really intriguing co uh, conversation. How are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? Like, are we still human, or how does this work? How foolish, he says. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. So now he's comparing this process to what? Agriculture, right? Mm -hmm. Plants, right? crops. What you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just as a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed, he gives it its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. Now, he might be speaking of like, sun, moon, and stars, or he could be speaking of spirit beings, because yeah, they're all heavenly. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is of one kind, the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and stars differ from star and splendor. You're like, yeah, where are you going with all this, Paul? I get it, things in creation are different. So here, here he brings it in. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. What does that mean? It'll never, it'll never die. die. It'll never perishable, but once you die, you'll never perish. It can't die, right? That's what this is. It's, it can't die. It is an immortal body. Um, it is sown in dishonor. How so? Well, when you that doesn't mean that you spit on the grave when you put him in the ground. It means that this is... You're going to avoid this now. Death is not something that, for instance, the Israelites were allowed to interact with. You touch a dead body, what are you? Unclean. What happens to a body when it's dead? It decays. It's actually a gross process. It's, dis it's dishonorable. That's why you hide it, by the way. You don't, lay bo you don't keep bodies laying out unless you want to dishonor them and disgrace them. Because you don't want to see this process undergo. Death is not something you want to observe. So you cover them with a sheet. You put them in the ground. You uh, burn them into ash and put them in a nice vase or something. Not vase, sorry. Uh, urn. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Slip of the tongue. Okay. Um, so it's raised in dishonor. Sorry. Sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. And this is a glory that won't fade. It's not a glory that turns to dishonor later. It's permanent because it's imperishable. It is sown in weakness. And I think that's one thing you can tell readily as you read the scriptures. Our physical bodies as they are now, in different kinds of ways, are weak. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in strength. power or strength. That's a picture of your future. Uh, it is sown a natural body. And it is raised a spiritual body. Now, that language can get a little tricky. Because now you're thinking, do I have a non-physical body in, in this whole picture? I don't believe that's what Paul's talking about. Because that contradicts what we know elsewhere. Je what, let me ask you this. Was Jesus' body physical yeah, when he yeah. came back from... Yeah. Yes. 
A spirit doesn't eat food, right? So what does he mean then by natural versus spiritual? In Paul's language, that's akin to old creation, new creation. So I, I think that's, that's the same way Paul would say the old is gone, the new has come. So the natural, perishable, no. It is now spiritual, meaning immortal. If there's a natural body, there's a spiritual body. It's written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual didn't come first. The natural did. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. As is the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we have been born, just as we have borne the image of the earthly man with these mortal physical bodies, so we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. And I read that to mean an immortal, imperishable, glorious body. So again, don't... I, I think it would be a mistake to read spiritual there to mean non-physical. That has to do with the new creation reality. That phrase today, of all times, today, we had a resident pass away. So when a oh. resident passes away, we have to wait for the undertaker to come. They take the body. So I happened to leave my office, and this resident's room is, was close by. And I see a coworker, like, peeking, like, in the room. And I come up behind her, I go, what are you doing? <laughs> she kind of like, she goes, oh my gosh, you scared me. I'm like, what are you doing? And she goes, I want to see if they took the body yet. And I went, what, do you want to see a body in a bag? And she goes, no. She said, you have to go in the room when they leave. You have to open the window and let the spirit out. She's like sincerely talking no, this way? she was dead serious. And I went, I started laughing. I said, Who told you that? She goes, well, we all know that's true. She and she's Catholic. Oh. She's I the person and I said, are you serious? And she goes, oh, we have to open the window to to let this so the spirit can leave. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Now I knew this was a, a thing. No, no. It's been a thing a long time, but to to know someone right here and now that would say yeah. that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I was I'm shocked. <laughs> I went, believe me, she's with the Lord. If she was a Christian, don't worry about it. But, yeah, she was dead serious. She, so she did, when they left, she went up and opened the window a little bit. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> now, you think about that. It's a spirit. How could a physical object Stop. get in its way? Yeah, that's, that's what I told her. Uh, Jesus came to the disciples when the door was locked. Yeah. yeah. Right? Okay. And, <laughs> and he had a new physical body, too, yeah. to boot, right? Wow. Yeah, well, except the ones that he said, touch them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, the, 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 I don't mean the scars are healed, but the, the wound was healed. And they only yeah, that's right. He's not still bleeding out or anything, yeah. I just saw a movie where that was a part of the main storyline, was uh, someone had failed to open the window, and so there was weird stuff happening. But it was, it was like based in 100 years ago or something. Oh, no. So to think that, wow. <laughs> Like, I don't mean to. I don't mean. Better than me too. <laughs> it wouldn't have worked if somebody just opened the door. Or something. That was good to say. Yeah, well, when they took the body out, you think would have went out the door. It's <laughs> a good point. I'm just. <laughs> I know. It has to go outside. Can you imagine what the Sadducees were thinking? Again, we're talking about when Christ died and, and all those bodies came to life. They had to be looking at each other, saying, "I know what you're talking about." I guess we were wrong. Guys, how do we explain I, this? I'm sure they probably count something in their hearts. Spin, spin doctor this one, guys. Yeah. yeah. Well, by the way, they thought they, they stole Jesus from the tomb. They obviously thought deception was at play. So they, oh, they had people dressed up as them and, or something. I don't know. Yeah. Or relation or family. <laughs> well, thank God we have the, this knowledge in the scriptures that we can share with people. Yeah. Because honestly, if you don't have that, you're, you're, you really are subject to whatever you were told by somebody else. And wow. All right. Well, we're going to sign off for those at home. We're going to pray together. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time.